I got a phone call from an insurance person, and I had to give a recorded testimony over the phone concerning an auto accident a few months ago. I was in Jackson, and some fella hid me from behind, and insurance companies were involved, and whenever you hear the person on the other end say, Mr. Spann, you do know this conversation is being recorded, and they call you Hubert, not Bert, <laughs> you realize the stakes are high. And as soon as they say, okay, go ahead and give your side of the story, you know the tape is rolling and you've got to tell them what you experienced. That's your testimony. I'm learning that anytime you tell a testimony, whether it be traffic issues or, or, or with your faith in Christ, it's not casual conversation. Nobody just ask if they're in the insurance business uh, over lighthearted conversation, would you please tell me your side of the story? Because when they ask these things, the stakes are high, money's on the line. They want to know the truth. They want to know what you, what you experienced. Anytime you give a testimony, the stakes are high. There's a lot on the line. The Apostle Paul has come to a point in life where he's gotten word from the churches in Galatia that they're starting to give up their faith in Jesus Christ and they're falling for this other gospel, which really is no gospel at all. And he writes a letter to address them and he begins right off the bat defending his apostleship. And we've come to a place in the text now where Paul gives his testimony. A testimony typically includes three things. One, it includes life before Christ. It includes how you came to know Christ. And then what's happened since you've come to know Christ. If you will, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to begin at verse 11. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. He's continuing to talk about the gospel here, and he all but says, you can't make the gospel up. No one can create a story like this. Jesus had to peel back the veil or the curtain for our eyes to see this. If you think of all the stories in history, there is no story quite like the gospel story. You can't make up, you and I can't creatively convince someone that the God of heaven who is perfect in all ways, who created you and I, who watched us rebel against him, would love us so much that he doesn't want to punish us, so he takes the punishment upon him, his very self, taking our place so that you and I can be saved. You can't make that story up. And Paul says, this is not a man-made story. God had to peel my eyes so that I could see what's happening. I want us to pause here for a moment. I want us to pray because before you and I can understand what God's got in store for the rest of this service, we have to have our eyes fully centered on him so that he can show us the truths that we cannot miss. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so very much for the fact that you have given us a gospel message that no man could have 
created. God, I don't stand here today because someone taught this to me in school. I stand here today because as a little boy, you changed my world. You stopped looking at me as a sinner who had rebelled against you and you started looking at me as your own kid because of the blood covering of Jesus. Father, I pray that you would open eyes in this room of those who may be spiritually blind. You would open ears of the spiritually deaf. Help us not to assume that we know what's about to be said because Saul assumed a lot of things before you met him and he became Paul. I pray that your spirit would be at work in this room and that you would stop us dead in our tracks if we are in rebellion against you. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. I want to look very quickly at a couple of things because I don't want you to think that I'm making up what a testimony is. Testimony includes what happened in your life before Christ. Let's pick up at verse 13. For you have heard my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Let me just say a couple of things right here. Every one of us has a story about life before Christ. There's not a person in this room that doesn't have that kind of story. If you were one who was saved at an early age, please don't think that your story is less amazing than the person that got off of drugs or, or, or crazy living because the fact is every one of us were on a paved street to hell and Jesus Christ stepped in and saved us. Yeah, I gave my life to Christ at the age of seven. I didn't have a crazy life beforehand other than G.I. Joe. That's not crazy in the world's eyes, but let me tell you, I was still lost. And an amazing God of grace reminded me that I needed Him as my Savior, not just as the one that I learned stories about in church. Every testimony is amazing when God steps in. But I will also say, this testimony of Paul is a testimony by someone who was deeply rooted in religion. You couldn't find a more religious person than Paul. So I'm here to tell you, just because you attend church and just because you know your yes ma'ams and no ma'ams and all the stories in the Bible does not mean that you're saved. And so I would highly recommend you listen today and let the Holy Spirit point to you if you have played religion and not been in a relationship. Please. Listen to what's going to be said today. But the next part of a testimony is how you come to know Christ. Look at verse 15. But when God who set me apart from birth and called me by His grace was pleased to reveal His Son in me. <laughs> wow, that is an understatement. To reveal His Son in me. If you go back to the book of Acts, you, you'll recount that story of what happened when God revealed His Son in, in Paul. Smooth knocked him off a horse. I mean, going this way, boom, crash, hit the ground, blind. Yes, that's how he came to know Jesus. Whenever I came to know Jesus, it wasn't quite like that. I just got down beside my bed on a Wednesday night before I went to sleep. I told Jesus that I was a sinner and I needed to be saved. Some people have the blinding experience. Some people don't. But if you're in a relationship with Jesus, there was a moment where intimacy between he and you connected and you became his. Verse 
And then the next part is the what now. Verse 16 again, running into it to reveal his son in me. Here's the part of, of his testimony. So that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Guys, that is such a mouthful because this tells me that God is the one who institutes our life from here on. Do you realize there was no logical reason for Paul to do what he did after he was saved? I mean, he had been a Jew of Jews, and God said, enough of that, I'm now sending you to the Gentiles. And so the rest of what we see in Paul's life is his ministry to the Gentiles, where God was taking him after that moment of salvation. Let me tell you, folks, if your testimony only includes what your life was like beforehand and how you came to know Jesus Christ and you stammer and stutter when you try to think of how you're being used by him now, then, then you might want to check to see if you really were saved because whenever he comes into a person, he radically changes their world. They're, they're not the same ever again. And Paul spent more time talking about what God was doing in him now than he ever did going back and looking back then. He would only bring out the what happened then in moments that he needed to. He spent most of his time talking about how God was using him now. With that being said, Steve and I have talked since the moment of his surrendering to Jesus Christ. And at first, the wound was real and raw and tough to talk about. But Steve has since said that the Lord has done something in him that the rest of this church family needs to hear. And so he has asked when it would be appropriate for him to share his story. And I figured, hey, if today's talking about testimonies in Galatians, well, this might be a pretty good time for him to share his testimony. So Steve, why don't you come on up? And I, I want to pray for you up here, and then I'm going to turn this over to you, okay? God, I love you, and I thank you so much for creating Steve. You knit him together in his mother's womb. He is fearfully and wonderfully made. He was bent toward the wrong master for way too long. And you did something amazing in him, grabbing his attention in a way no one ever would want, but doing something in his life that we all long for. As he shares his story, Father, I pray that you would give him clarity of mind. But more than that, I pray that everything he says would point people to Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. It's yours, sir. Hello. Can you know, can Testing this thing out. I've been wanting to do this for quite a while. But y'all bear with me here. It's going to take a little effort on my part. Before I get started, I want to take this time to, to thank everyone for their prayers and for their support in sharing and I's times of trouble. I'm going to read from Titus chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They confess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable 
and disobedient, and under every good work, reprobate. What I'm about to tell y'all, some of you, it may come as a shock. Some of you may say you knew it all along. And still others of you may question my sanity when I get through. But I can assure you that I am more sane now than I have ever been. My first memory of church was as a young boy, about eight or nine years old. We went to a primitive Baptist church. It was about 35 or 40 miles from where I lived. We didn't go every Sunday because they didn't have church there every Sunday. But the whole time that I was there, I never saw an altar call. I never saw anyone come forward. And I never saw anybody get baptized. In fact, I didn't even know what baptism was for the longest time. You see, they were big on predestination. And they were so big on it that they thought everything was worked out before the foundation of the world. Even one's salvation. By the time I was a teenager, I didn't go to church anymore. My parents didn't push me on that because, well, my salvation was already worked out. When I was a senior in high school, I fell in with the wrong crowd. They introduced me to alcohol. For someone who spent most of his time, most of his free time anyway, alone in his bedroom, reading books. Alcohol was a way for me to fit in, a way for me to be accepted. When I graduated high school, I went to college for a couple of years and couldn't decide what I wanted to major in, so I dropped out and I went to work. And I worked at a few jobs for a few years. This whole time, my drinking got worse. At the ripe old age of 23, I got on with the Columbia Gulf, and my drinking really picked up after that. When I was 24 years old, I got arrested for DUI, spent a night in jail. But instead of it making me want to quit drinking, I moved out of my parents' home. I got an apartment in the town where I like to drink so I could be closer to the bars. With Columbia Gulf, I worked offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, and I was on for eight days, and I was off for six days. A typical day off for me went something like this. As soon as I got to land, and I was able to buy some beer, I would start drinking. And I would drink for the six and a half hours it took me to get home. When I got back in town, then I would hit the bars until they closed. I'd go to my apartment, I'd go to bed, I'd get up about noon the next morning, or the next day, I'd stumble around my apartment a little bit, get woke up real good, and then I would, I had a 10-speed bicycle, and I would get on that bike, and I would ride it 30 miles round trip. I sweat, try to sweat everything out of me. And I'd get back to my apartment, I'd get cleaned up, and I would be at the bars by 4 or 5 o'clock, happy hour. I like going to happy hour because not only were the drinks a little cheaper, but sometimes they would have snacks there. And I would eat some peanuts or cheese and crackers, and every now and then they'd have something like chicken wings. And I've often joked that if it hadn't been for happy hour, I would have starved to death. 
I frequented this place so often that the bartender, when she would see me coming, by the time I slid up on a bar stool, she would have a drink already sitting there waiting on me. I drank vodka, but I didn't drink just any kind of vodka. I drank a particular brand of vodka, and so she would have it waiting on me, and she would show me the bottle whenever I came in there, and she would say, I just opened up a new bottle. And I would sit there and drink until the place closed down about 2 a.m. And they would always have a last call for alcohol, and I wanted to get that last drink in like they were going to run out. And she would show me the bottle again, and it would be, you know, maybe that much left in the bottle, just enough for another drink. And she'd say, you drank it all by yourself. Nobody else drinks this but you. I'd go back to my apartment, I'd go to bed, I'd get up at noon the next day and start the process all over again. I did that every day for years. I had a friend of mine that I worked with offshore and he was a bad alcoholic and he was the kind of alcoholic that when he drank, he wouldn't stop until he passed out. He couldn't remember what he did the night before. And he told me a time about that he, he was out drinking and he decided to go home and he was driving home and he got sleepy. So he parked his truck, he put it in park, he left the engine running and he went to sleep in the middle of a major highway. And I knew I was headed for that same, that same thing if I didn't straighten my act up a little bit. So what I did is I started just going to the bar and drinking two or three drinks, and then I would just drink water or Coke the rest of the night. It was about this time that I met Sharon. I remember when she came in, she was beautiful. But not only that, I knew she wasn't a regular because I was a regular and I knew every, all the regulars that frequented the bars. And I may not know them by name, but I knew their faces and I knew she was different. And I never asked anybody to dance. I just don't, I don't dance. I got two left feet and one of those attached to a broken ankle. And if you want to see a comedy act, just get me to dance. But I went and I asked her to dance. And she said no. So I waited a few songs and there was a live band pl pl playing and I waited a few songs and I went and I asked her again and she said no again. So I waited a few more songs and a slow song came on and I knew I, I wouldn't look that bad if I was go up there and dance at a slow song. So I went and I said, what the heck, I'll give it one more shot. And I went and asked her again. And to my surprise, she said yes. She told me later she just said yes because she wanted me to quit bugging her. But anyway, we got up on the dance floor and I introduced myself. She introduced herself and I remembered her and she forgot me. But fortunately for me, we met again a few weeks later, and I remembered her. And to make a long story short, a couple years after that, we were married. And then Brooke came along, and I decided I needed to clean up my act some more, so I quit drinking altogether. I'm telling you all this to let you know that a person can make good choices. We have the ability to do that, and we have the ability to clean our own act up if we choose to. When Brooke was about four years old, we moved up here, and we were renting a house over here in Columbia, and James Brewer was building us a house over here, and the house we live in right now. And we drove over here 
one day and we just would check on, see how things were going and James was, was there and we got to talking. And James invited us to come to church here at First Baptist. I think this sanctuary had just been built and it might have been the first service that they had in here. I remember telling Sharon it'd be a good example for the kids if we'd go to church. So we came to church. And for the next six years, we came here off and on. In fact, John, our son, started coming here on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights because he got plugged into the youth group. And we came up here on a Sunday and we watched Brooke and John get baptized. One Friday evening when I got off of work, I got home and Sharon told me that Billy Graham was going to be in Nashville and she wanted to go and see the old man before he died. I really didn't want to go, but it was a Friday night and I didn't have to go to work the next day and it was a good chance for me to see the new Titan Stadium that had been built. So I agreed and we went. Sharon got saved that night. I saw a change in her. She had a joy about her. A peace. A, some contentment. And I kept waiting on her to change back to the way she was, but she never did. Instead, she got more involved in the church here. She got me to start coming up here more often, and I got to hear a lot about the free will of man and how man has a say-so. He can either choose or reject Christ. And I didn't believe that too much because of my background, and I remember we'd get in the car and drive home after a sermon, and i tell Sharon that was a pretty good sermon until they started talking about that salvation crap. And that's what I called it, crap. But I got to looking around and noticing something else. I got to seeing other people who had that same joy and contentment and peace about them. And I got to wanting that. I even stopped off at Richard Tate's a couple of times and talked to him about coming down. And one Sunday morning after Richard had given a sermon, and we were between pastors at that time, Richard Tate gave a sermon here. And I came forward, and I can't tell you the date, the month, or the year that I did that. But it was an emotional time for me. It was quite emotional, and I thought I had it. I thought I had that peace and that joy that everybody else had, and I cleaned my act up some more. I quit using foul language, and I stopped telling dirty jokes, and I started reading my Bible and studying my Bible, and I started coming to church more regularly. I was here every time the door opened up. And everything went pretty smooth there for a while. And then Brother Mike Nolan came here. You see, Brother Mike, he liked to go to these men's conferences in Memphis. And I remember the first one that I went to. There's something about seeing two or three thousand men, just men, gathering in a place and worshiping God. I recommend it to anybody who hasn't ever been to one. But they had an altar call there, and it looked like hundreds of men came down to the front. But there was this one man in particular. He was sobbing. He wasn't just crying. He was sobbing uncontrollably. I'd never seen a grown man do that before. 
And this little voice in the back of my head, this little quiet voice, said, you didn't do that. And I quickly pushed it aside and I said, I've changed. I'm reading my Bible. I'm studying it. I'm going to church regularly. I quit using foul language. I was even teaching a discipleship class here. Brother Mike also liked to get together with other churches and for different reasons. And I remember going to one of those with him and I think we were trying to become better Sunday school teachers or something. I don't remember exactly, but I do remember this. We split off in groups. And they asked us to write down our testimony. And man, these guys, and they were grabbing these pencils, and man, they would start scribbling on a piece of paper, and there I was staring at a blank piece of paper. And finally, I just wrote on there, I wanted what everybody else had. And then they would ask for volunteers to give their testimony and they would stand up and while all of them were unique to them, they all were similar. Some of them were alcoholics and Jesus took them away from that. Some of them had never even heard of Jesus and they grew up in a home where they never went to church and nobody ever talked about Jesus and they had led terrible lives and then one day they met Jesus and it changed their life. And I was sitting there sweating bullets hoping nobody asked me to give mine. And that little voice popped up in my mind again. And it said, you don't have a testimony. And I would tell it I've changed and I would start clicking off the different things that I had done to try to prove that I had changed. We were also at that time having communion regularly, ever so often like we do now. And I remember... Brother Mike gave a sermon on 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where the Apostle Paul said don't take communion if you're not worthy. That was the reason why some of you were sick and some of you had fallen asleep and that little voice was so loud telling me you sure you want to do this? And I would scream at it. I've changed. I was studying my Bible. I'm going to church more regularly. The Apostle Paul would have been proud of the way that I studied the Bible. But I was studying it for the wrong reasons, and I knew that. You see, I was on the Internet, and I was arguing with people on the Internet. And I, if anybody had asked me, I'd have said, I'm trying to bring them to Christ, but that wasn't the truth. What I was really trying to do was win an argument. I wanted to show everybody I knew more about the Bible than they did. But there's, my health started going down about that time, and, but there was something else that was changing, something on the inside of me. A different kind of sickness. I started getting all twisted up inside. I started turning dark. I looked fine on the outside, but on the inside it was in turmoil. Started going to places on the internet I shouldn't have been going. One day they called me. They come and got me. I was at work and they come and got me and they brought me into the office. 
And they already had a letter written up and they gave it to me. You see, I, all of that has started to change my outward attitude. I began to hate everything about my life. I began to hate my job. I began to really hate the people I work with. I began to hate coming to church. I stopped studying my Bible. And they brought me into that office. They already had this letter typed up and they give it to me and they begin to read it and they said, you were terminated. You were no longer welcome on the company property. They didn't even want me to talk to any of the employees unless it was about company business. And I argued with them and but their minds were already made up. They said it wasn't open for discussion. I was eligible for retirement, and they told me I could do that. That's the only thing I could talk them into. After 35 years with them, that's the way I went out. And in my depressed state of mind and the way I was at, I, I, really, I really spiraled down after that. But instead of turning to my wife, or my pastor, or my friends. I went to my true God, the internet, and I started talking to people on there that were evil, dark, lost people like me. I was even, it got so bad, I was even talking to someone about hacking into something. I was about to break the law. You see, I'd given up. I'd already come to the conclusion that by that time that I wasn't saved. And I really didn't think God had any interest in saving a person like me, a hypocrite like me. And then, one day, my wife found out. She found out about everything that I was doing. And it was almost a relief because I didn't have to pretend anymore and the double life that I was leading, I, I didn't have to worry about doing that anymore. But we had a huge fight and, you know, we'd had disagreements in the past like normal married couples do from time to time, but nothing like this. And we fought way into the night. And we finally, I think, just got too tired to fight anymore. She went her way into the bedroom. And I went my way. I went to a to a room that we have above the our garage. We call it the bonus room. And when I walked up those stairs, I thought our marriage was over. We have the recliners up there, and I sat down in a recliner, and I was physically and mentally exhausted. And I leaned that recline her back and I fell asleep instantly like I didn't have a care in the world and I don't I don't know how long I slept but suddenly I woke up and I was like writhing and squirming in anguish and pain it wasn't a physical pain, no, it was some kind of other pain. And it was pitch black dark. The blackness was so thick, it was like a wall, and I could have reached out and touched it. 
And I remember putting my hands over my face and I cried out to God, I can't take this anymore. Jesus, help me. And I couldn't sit still and I was squirming so much in that chair, I decided I'd get up and I stood up in that room, in that pitch black dark room and I I think I just made a couple of circles in there. I, I didn't know what to do, but the whole time I was crying out, God, I can't take this anymore. And then all at once, a feeling came over me that you're too high. So I walked down those stairs. And I got to the bottom of those stairs and I was still crying out, God, I cannot take this anymore. And I was still too high. I got down on my hands and knees. And I was crawling across the floor and I was screaming out, God, I cannot take this anymore. And it was still pitch black around me. I don't know if I had my eyes open or closed. I really don't know. But I went a little ways like that and I was still too high. I went down on my stomach and I crawled across the floor. I slithered like a snake. I don't know how I moved. But I was crying out to God, I cannot take this anymore. And an image or a vision, you can call it whatever you want, it came into my mind. I won't never forget it. I was hanging on the edge of this hole, this dark black hole. And I was looking over my shoulder trying to find, trying to see the bottom of it because I just knew I was about to fall in it. And I couldn't see the bottom. And I was in such pain and anguish, I, I just wanted it all to stop. And I was, kept sliding across that floor crying out, God, I can't take this anymore. And I got to our bedroom and I got to our chest of drawers and I pulled myself up on those chest of drawers and I pulled that top drawer open and I reached in there and the pistol that we had kept there for 21 years was gone. It wasn't there. And I whirled around and Sharon was sitting up in the bed and she had a lamp on over there and it was just like there was no light except right there. And I screamed at her, where is it? And she didn't have to even ask me what it was. She said, it's gone. And I fell back to the floor and I crawled out of that room and I made it as far as a footstool. And in my mind, I was still screaming out. And I thought I was coming out of me. God, I can't take this anymore. But Sharon told me later that it was some of the most evil screams and noises she had ever heard coming out of me. And I laid my head on that footstool and I sobbed. I sobbed. I didn't cry. I sobbed. I was so broken. And about that time, Brooke had come downstairs and I saw her and I didn't want her to see me like that so I tried to crawl away from her and she told me that 
I was drenched in sweat. That my shirt was soaking wet. I had a, made it then as far as the bonus room stairs again. And that's as far as I got. I just sit there and I put my head in the corner between the door and the wall and I sob some more. Brooke was so concerned about me that she called Kelvin. And I don't know what time that was, but Kelvin came over. And by the time he came over, I had started to calm down. And he sat right there in the floor beside me, just sit there. I think I tried to explain to him what happened. I don't, I don't think I made any sense. I don't know what came out. But after we sat there and talked a while, then we went back. He asked me, could we just go up in the bonus room where it's more comfortable? And we did. And I don't know, yo, I don't know how it happened. I don't know when exactly it happened. But sometime between there and all of that happening, Jesus Christ, I met Jesus Christ that night. And my life has changed. And when Calvin left, he asked me, are you going to be okay? And I told him I was because I knew from that day forward God would be with me. That day is July the 23rd, 2015. And my life hasn't been the same since. I didn't know if I still had a marriage. It was about daylight when Kelvin left. I had to ask Sharon to forgive me. I told her that I had changed. I wasn't the same. But it took some convincing she did forgive me. She's still with me. And some of y'all, I know you may be saying, well, how do we know you change now? Well, you don't. Only God can know a man's heart. But I'll tell you this. The Bible says you can know somebody by their fruits. And I Telling y'all right now, you just stand back and watch. If you don't think I've changed, you just watch. I have never, ever wanted to go on a mission trip before. This summer, we're going to Africa. and God be willing, I, I don't have any money. I don't have any resources. I don't know how he's going to do it. But if he's willing, I'm going to Africa, y'all. I'm going to start doing things for Jesus Christ because I'm a servant of him now. Since that day, Sharon and I have had a better marriage in the whole 26 years before that. I now treat her like Christ would treat the church. I've never done that before. Never had a desire to. My whole desire now in life is to serve Christ. We've had to deal with quite a lot since that day. I've had to step out in faith a few times. And I believe it's God testing me. He said, hey, you said you're going to follow me in faith? And here we go.
I didn't have a testimony before now. But now I do. Yeah. I thank you all for listening to me. May God bless each and every one of you. Steve to stay right here guys we're about to move into a time that we call the invitation it's not my invitation to you this is the Lord's invitation to you and I want Steve to stand here because he is an example of what it looks like to have attended this church year after year after year and never know Jesus in a personal way. I don't care how long your name has been on the rolls here. I don't care how many churches you've been in your whole life. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your master, you've never submitted to his lordship. You are in the state Steve was in, lost. You may have cleaned up your language, you may have gotten rid of bad habits, you may even be reading your Bible or even a teacher in Sunday school, but that has no bearing on whether or not Jesus is your Lord. There may be some of you in here who've never been in church your whole life, but you want this Jesus to come in and change you like he's changed Steve. You identify with all of the things that Steve said he was a part of. I want you to know that Jesus has already taken care of all of the punishment on the cross. And what you deserve, he's already taken upon himself. And if you will submit yourself to his lordship, he will forgive you. You'll be a brand new person. In just a few minutes, we're going to sing. I'm going to ask you just to to keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. As we sing here in just a few moments, if you need to come, please do so. There will be some men down here to talk to you. Or maybe you just need to come pray. This is your time to come. Let's stand and sing with your heads bowed. You respond.